All right, my friend. So we're back in action with the Miss Bionic Dance. And the question on the table is the problem of evil. And we are discussing it. Now, my original assertion, if you remember correctly, was that atheists have positional arrogance, not personal arrogance, mind you, positional arrogance in their relationship to the big questions of life, vis-a-vis -vis the big questions of life. For example, the problem of evil. So, now, let's take a look. Imagine you are, you are a chess player. You're, okay, you're a decent chess player, by way of analogy. Imagine you are a chess player. You're a decent chess player, you're not great. Uh, you sort of, you're sort of a beginner. Sitting across, from the ta a ta sitting across the table from you is the greatest chess player of all time. Game starts. He's the greatest chess player of all time. Okay? The game starts. You make, you make a couple moves, he makes a couple moves. Lo and behold, he moves his queen into a place where you can grab it. You're like, oh my god. <laughs> Do you go? Oh my god, what an idiot. I can't believe he just put his queen right there. He made a mistake. I'm going to win this game. You might. But keep in mind, this is the greatest chess player of all time across the table from you. So you might just assume that he made a mistake. Probably far more likely is you'll go, it looks like he made a mistake. But he's the greatest chess player of all time, and I'm not that great. He must know something that I don't. So you study the board. And you're like, no, for the life of me, I can't see, I can't see any way that that isn't a mistake. So there you go, boom, take his queen. Boom, 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 three, me, three, three moves later. Checkmate, you lost. What happened? He knew something that you didn't. Your original assessment, rooted in humility, was, wow, he must know something I don't. Now, you see where I'm going with the analogy. Let's change it to God. I look out at, at the seeming flaw in his game plan. And I say to myself internally, well, wait a minute, he is God. He must know something that I don't. And I ascribe to him omnibenevolence. Now, as you pointed out successfully, in my, in my original defenses, I have been rooting that too much in personal experience. Is it partially rooted in my own personal experience of his benevolence to me? Yes, that's fair and reasonable. Is that good enough? No, as you correctly pointed out uh, with your Darth Vader analogy. No, that's not good enough because there is evil out there in the world and it does not seem to be reconcilable with his omnibenevolence. Hence the problem of evil. Now, I have partially rooted my own complete and utter conviction of his omnibenevolence in his benevolence towards me. That's not good enough. I also see in total, in total, that life is far more good than evil. There is far more beautiful and good in the world than there is evil. Now, that's debatable. You, you may take issue with that. Okay? Um, but the idea, now it's just one version of the atheist problem of evil and made most famously by the, the Epicurean Paradox. And I'm relatively sure you know it, so I won't say it. But the Epicurean Paradox is rooted in arrogance because it's, it's taking a human perspective and assuming that because I cannot see any possible flaw, any possible reason, any possible good reason that there is so much evil in the world, there cannot be so much evil in the world. I can't answer it personally, therefore it must be wrong. The same mistake you make when you're playing the greatest chess player of all time. You've got to assume that he knows something that you don't. That position is rooted in humility. However arrogant Christians may be about any other thing in the world, which they often are, that, that position vis-a-vis -vis the problem of evil is rooted in humility. And 
the Bible says, childlike faith. Childlike faith. Now, is it the correct position? I believe 100% yes, that is the correct position. Let's go to the book of Job. The book of Job takes on evil directly. Recognizes that there's evil in the world and it seems to be arbitrary. That's the key of the book of Job. The evil seems to be arbitrary. It doesn't seem to be, you know, God's justice. It seems to be just insane, terrible things. The book of Job answers the problem. Now, nobody really discusses the book correctly. The most important part in the book of Job, two most important parts of the book of Job, God, Satan goes before God, and he says, I'm going to do all these terrible things to Job. Point number one about this. First of all, whether you give Satan, whether Satan is a real being or a metaphor for all of the crazy, chaotic evil in the world, the most important thing to notice is that he exists outside of God. It isn't God. It is a different thing. God says to him, the most important line in the whole story, go for it, but go this far and no further. That's extraordinarily important. Yes, there is a, there's an enormous amount of evil in the world. And yes, if God is omnipotent, he is some, to some degree, has allowed every single minute of it. The Bible agrees with you perfectly. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been handed over to me. Hence, God could stop it at any time. And he does not. I assume, based on my position spiritually, that he knows what he's, he knows something I don't. And he has a very, 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 very good reason for it. And I search my heart to try and find the reason just like you do. Do I necessarily come up with the good answers? No. Faith is the good answer. The book of Job answers the question. How does it do that? At the end of the story, Job goes to God and sees him as he truly is. Perfect in all his glory. Perfect in his manifold perfection. His unerring beauty. And Job says simply, I repent in dust and ashes and I abhor myself. What does it mean? It means I'm sorry for questioning you. I can see now that I see you with my own eyes. That you are actually perfect. That you are actually truly and honestly perfect and good. In other words, he just says, hallelujah, it's all right, it's all good. Now, if you are a lover of life, that makes sense to you. And you, to some degree, you and I are not as far apart as you think. We don't have that big of a chasm between us. You know, you're not a sociopath, obviously. You have some love of life and some reverence for life in your heart of hearts. You know, things that you love. If you see the benevolent in the cre benevolence in the created world, if there is a God, He is the sole source, the sole author of all of that benevolence. Therefore, worthy of praise. That is the Christian worldview. Now, are Christians arrogant? Yes, but that particular stance towards a question like the problem of evil is not rooted in arrogance. It's rooted in humility. It's, ro it's rooted in a humble understanding of who I am versus who God perhaps is. That's all. Um, you know, you can call me all manner of jerk in your response. That's cool. I don't have a problem with... I do not have a problem at all with you playing rough. I just want you to play fair. If I would like you to play the whole analogy for the people if you're going to trash the analogy. You know, go for it. You know, tear it apart. Uh, trash what I said about the book of Job, that's fine, tear it apart, but play the whole thing if you're going to, or, you know, just m don't distort what I say, that's all. And the second video, you didn't, you know, to be perfectly honest, I don't think you did. So, that's that. Uh, thank you very much.